Good morning. Thank you for tuning into this webinar as we explore the detrimental effects of isolation on the minority community. My name is Marcus Atkinson. I am the CEO of the Public Voice Media, and I am also the principal at M. Atkinson and Associates, a small consulting group. So I want to start this conversation with a recent event in my life. In the past month, I've attended seven funerals. And each of these funerals had different reasons for happening. Of those seven funerals, four have been COVID related. And at one funeral in particular, it was for a classmate of mine. And this is a very um, mixed school that we graduated from. It had people from various ethnic, socioethnic, back, economic backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds. And so a lot of my classmates attended this funeral and it was blended in that manner as well. And I sat in the back. I sat right by a white classmate of mine that I've known since junior high school. And the emotion of this funeral service just overcame him in ways that he couldn't really explain. And as the pastor started to talk about the deceased and give his testimony about the deceased and quote scripture and bring in different people to, to sing and express themselves through song and the audience in that church just gave way to the emotion that is pretty typical at funerals, especially funerals for African-Americans. And it was interesting to watch this friend as he watched this kind of emotional outpouring at this funeral. There were times that he rocked back and forth. There's times that he would throw his hands in the air. There's a time when the pastor referred to the deceased as our brother and he shouted out, yes, he was my brother, he was my brother. He stood up for a minute or two and kind of paced along the back of the, the church. He didn't know what to do with himself. We circled back not long afterwards and he said, what is that? What was that? He had never experienced this type of emotion at church or at a funeral service for people that were not of African-American descent. And so as he and I talked, I had to remind him that this is not a simple answer, although the question seems simplistic enough. And one of the things that I reminded him is to have this conversation is for him to understand that history matters. It's remembering the past gives way, gives power to the present. And this historical journey of the uniqueness of these people that we call African-Americans has to be put in context for someone to, to fully understand something as simplistic of as the outpouring of emotion in church. And so as we explore the detrimental effects of COVID-19 on the African-American community, on the minority community, one must also think about the history of and consider the history of this unique group of people in order to fully understand and appreciate what this moment in history means to African-Americans. And as you see numbers and statistics, you also get an opportunity to, to uh, just kind of uh, process it through this lens of these people. And so I always start with my own great grandparents. One of the benefits of being born to a young mother, as tragic as that situation was, this was one of the few benefits. My mother was 17 when she had my brother, 19 when she had me. Because of that, I had the unique opportunity to get to know these two individuals personally. My great grandmother, Gertrude Arrington, died when I was 10. My great grandfather, um, Kane Arrington, died when I was 17. So I got a chance to really get to know them, hear their stories, and to truly understand who they were as individuals. Those are my maternal grandparents, great grandparents. These are my paternal great grandparents, Papa Zeke and Mama Lula. And they're from Houston, Mississippi. These two I did not have an opportunity to get to know, but their stories are, are the stuff of legend in our family. And so you see this image of uh, this proud son of a sharecropper and the histories of both of these great grandparents are very, very similar. When you look at my great grandfather's history, Watt Arrington was his father. Watt Arrington was a slave in South Carolina. This is the image on the front of a reunion t-shirt for that side of the family, Mississippi from 2012. 
And as I speak to some of my white counterparts and some of my white brothers and sisters, we oftentimes talk about the extensive uh, family reunions that African-Americans have. And many of my white friends identify with their nuclear family much, much more than they do their extended family. It is usually a matter of siblings, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, things along those lines. They also have cousins and aunts and uncles. But the extensive family that surrounds the African-American family and the way that they plug into that and identify with that on a regular basis is something that other groups may not identify with as much. And so this image of great-great-grandpa Watt on the cover or on the, the front of this t-shirt enables us to really reflect on everything that was paid in order for us to do the things that we're doing today. We do the same thing on my paternal side of the family. This is the front and back of a t-shirt for an Atkinson reunion. This was our 55th reunion and it shows the trek from Houston, Mississippi to Erie, Pennsylvania. And on the back, you see the siblings of my grandfather, the children of Mama Lula and Papa Zeke. Again, for the sake of remembering. Things like this give us a sense of belonging. And when you think about that from a psychology standpoint, you look at these sentences from itspsychologytoday.com. And I want to read this. It says, the sense of belonging is a sense of identification with a specific group, which can range from a sports team to an institution or a complete society. It is based on the human need for affiliation, described by Maslow as one of the necessary requirements to feel good about ourselves. The sense of belonging occurs when the person feels that he is part of something bigger than him and therefore recognizes the rest of the members of his reference group as equals. This can have a very positive effect on their self-esteem and it is especially important for young people. We'll add to that because when you have a marginalized group, a traumatized, marginalized group. I submit to you that having a sense of belonging becomes that much more important. And so when you see the family reunions, and when you see the extensive nature of us honoring the ancestors that came before us at these family reunions, it helps add to our family's sense of belonging to the community that came before us, and to our family community now. That's very important as you consider what's going on right now with COVID-19 and its effects on African-Americans. Let's go back to that church experience that I talked about earlier that I discussed and kind of debriefed with a friend about. That started during the days of slavery for African-Americans. You may be one of those people that's intrigued by uh, the environment and the culture of the black church. When you see this proud little praise house that was neatly planted behind um, a little shack on a plantation, this was the area that African Americans at that time were able to go worship their God freely and for a few fleeting moments feel free. This was one of the first places where African Americans had positions and titles amongst themselves which is why even when you go to the black church today, it's a very serious thing when it comes to the title of a pastor, a bishop, an apostle, whatever their title is. And for the most part, most African-American pastors, bishops, and so on are extremely particular about you utilizing that title. You look at some of the internal titles and boards, de deacons and deaconesses, and things along these lines. This was the area that allowed us to feel human and free. And it also allowed us to put the troubles of the day, if you will, on the altar at that time and process it and let it out. And that outpouring of emotion that we talk about so often, that outpouring of emotion that this friend of mine inquired about, this is the genesis of that. And if you follow that from slavery to now, you see the birth of certain leaders like Dr. King, and we never forget that he was a doctor of theology and that his entire being was intertwined in his work as a pastor, a reverend. And it was this launching pad that gave way to the civil rights movement and to the, the, the fight for equality that many of us have researched, heard about, or seen over time. And that same feeling exists today. That same outpouring of emotion exists today. And when you go to church, you may see the hands up. 
You may see people stand in the aisles. You may see people talk back to the pastor. That emotion, that freedom, that is where this was rooted from. And so I'll go back to that original photo of this older woman in church with that proud church hat on that we are so familiar with. That outpouring of emotion is rooted in the process and the processing of the pain and suffering that these people endure over time. They found a sense of belonging and we still find a sense of belonging in the church today. But now that sense of belonging carries over into other areas as well. Recently, we watched the election of President-elect Joe Biden. President-elect Joe Biden did something very unprecedented. We'd already seen what it looks like to have the first black president. And now a woman of color was selected as the running mate for Joe Biden. And now president-elect Joe Biden is partnered with Vice President-elect Kamala Harris. There are a lot of firsts tied into uh, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris's uh, appointment. One of those firsts is this is the first vice president to have attended an HBCU, a historically black college and university. This is also the first president to, or vice president, to have come from one of our historically black sororities and or fraternities. She is a part of Alpha Kappa Alpha, Sorority Incorporated, a very proud sorority of powerful, intelligent Black women. And if you look at these photos, it gives you an idea of the sisterhood that exists. And the photo on the right gives you a snapshot of this vast community across this country. And this is but a, a, a snapshot, a small inkling of the amount of women that are part of this sorority and others. And just as a point of, of history and a point of um, information, if you are curious about other AKAs, Maya Angelou, for those of you that are educationally um, inclined, is an AKA. Dr. Mae Jemison, first African-American woman in space. She also is an AKA for those of you that are interested in science. For those of you that are interested in music, Gladys Knight, famously of Gladys Knight and the Pips is an AKA. And lastly, for those of you that are into television, the iconic Felicia Rashad, who played Claire Huxtable, is also an AKA. But the most famous AKA of all would be our dear sister, Coretta Scott King, who you see in this photo lovingly kissing her husband, Dr. Martin Luther King, who is a part of the brother fraternity of this sorority, the Alphas. When you look at the last moment of Dr. King's life on that porch or that, that upper balcony of the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, you will see that every single one of these individuals has a sorority or fraternity affiliation. And you'll see some to this very day that are connected here in this community. The Kappas of Rafa Abernathy, if you are familiar with Gary Horton, he himself is a Kappa. The Alphas of Dr. King, if you're familiar with the uh, the Omegas of Jesse Jackson, if you're familiar with the King Center in Erie, its executive director, James Sherrod, is an Omega as well. And so these traditions, these organizations give African-Americans a sense of belonging. And they play a very, very large role in the community for that purpose. And so I want to pivot a little bit as you think about all of that and the connectedness of African-Americans through their churches, through their sororities and fraternities, as an example, you also start to think about, as we are honoring the past, the downside that comes with that is the intergenerational trauma that is inflicted from passing some of these stories on and the fact that we are ever conscious of the things that our people endured leading up to this moment. And so this is a small video clip that I want to show you that is actually from the Healing Foundation in Australia. And this speaks about indigenous people of Australia. I thought it was fascinating because if you looked at this video and listened to this video and, and researched the, the mission of this organization, very easily you could take the story of African-Americans in America and compare it, and it's very, very similar. But when you think about intergenerational trauma, I think that this video does a great job of explaining 
just how that plays out. We knew who we were and where we belonged. We took care of each other, our land and our waters. We ate food that made us healthy, lived on country and abided by our laws and song lines. Our families, our children were happy with strong minds and hearts because they were where they belonged. But then everything changed. Colonization came, bringing wars, disease, famine, violence, and the destruction and violation of our cultural laws, sacred sites, families, and communities. We were denied our knowledge, language, ceremonies, and identity. The very things that tell us who we are and where we belong, and our connections with each other and the land grew weak. And then, our children were taken from us. They had their names changed and their identities stripped away. They were told that Aboriginal people were bad. Worse still, they were told that their parents and grandparents did not want them. For years this happened, and those children became known as the Stolen Generations. Our children were denied love and experienced physical, emotional and sexual abuse. This left very deep, very complex, and very real wounds, leaving scars that are still being felt personally, socially, spiritually, and collectively. In the time when our story started, we were able to parent in the cultural way that has seen our family survive and thrive for generations. Our people were strong, and our culture flowed and healed us in times of hurt. But since the trauma of colonization and the stolen generations, we have not been able to heal in the same way. And we have unknowingly passed this trauma on to our children through sharing our sad stories and having them witness and experience our pain. This is known as intergenerational trauma. And we see symptoms today in broken relationships, disconnected families, violence, suicide, and drug and alcohol abuse. So that was a very heavy video. When you research their work, you know, I personally can appreciate all of the time that was put into it and the outcomes of much of the information that they researched. And I wanted to reach at a different group with a similar plight just so that we can try to understand that when we talk about a marginalized group and intergenerational trauma, it doesn't matter where that group is, if there is a certain pathway taken, this sets in. So I wanna go back to some of the same images from my own family that we discussed earlier as we move closer to having a better understanding of the detrimental effects of isolation on minorities during COVID-19. When we go to the, the reunions, on the right-hand side, you see the journey of Mama Lulu and Papa Zeke. And it talks about their family and their trek from slavery to where they ended up and how they went from there to Erie. The stories that they've had to endure are told to our family members. This is a presentation that I had the honor of making at one of our family reunions at our dinner on Saturday night, which is normally how it flows. Friday is registration. We all get together and gather at a picnic. Saturday, we gather and at another picnic, picnic, and then we have a formal on Saturday evening. And at that formal, before we uh, kind of socialize as family, we talk about the history of our family. And so this takes place in my paternal family's reunion. This document, the back of the t-shirt that I showed you earlier, that had the father of my great-grandfather, Cain, his father, Watt Arrington. The back of this t-shirt shows my great-grandfather, Cain, and his siblings, and the names of all of those. Now, I've circled a name for an uncle, Ali Arrington. And I circled that name because this is the uncle that was lynched. My great-grandfather witnessed this from a distance. I'll never forget the look in his eyes. He retells this story. And it's one of the few times that I've ever seen my great-grandfather very, very emotional. He was a very stoic farmer. 
He was a hard man, he was a loving man, but he was very typical of what you would expect a Southern farmer to be like. But when he tells this story, it's a very emotional thing for him. And so obviously, as offsprings of his, we internalize these stories and these stories become our stories. I go to my great grandmother and these documents that hang in my office now at Magazine and Associates of two relatives of hers, one of which Simon Lott from 1797, the paperwork of him being emancipated in New York, another of which Stephen in 1854, who was sold into slavery in Savannah, Georgia. The collection of all of these papers to the best of her ability to hand down to relatives as they hang on my wall, they hang on walls of other relatives. This trauma, this journey is handed down from generation to generation. And on the one hand, it's a necessity because you never want people to forget the price that was paid for you to be doing a webinar on Saturday morning for an organization to educate people during COVID-19, to serve as your own, as your own um, business owner, to have a formal education. These things are bought and paid for by this journey. And so you want to edify that at the same time, when we talk about intergenerational trauma, you do internalize and digest all of the same stress in many ways. And when you add that to the current issues that African-Americans deal with and the disparities, and then these types of things become compounded. And so we segue from there to think about the mental health of African-Americans. There's an article that I found, I found very um, informative, and a lot of this information comes from that particular article. For, for all of the, the different things that I've researched on this matter, I think that they nail it. But when you think about mental health in the African-American communities, it's almost anathema amongst African-Americans to speak about it openly. These words, mental health, hardly ever pass the lips of African-Americans as we're speaking to one another because of the journey of African-Americans, you learn, as unhealthy as it may be, to just deal with life as it comes. Because the journey has been so difficult, because the journey has been so hard, because the journey has been so disproportionately unfair in many, many ways for African-Americans, and not just unfair in ways as if you would speak about someone cheating in a game, but unfair in ways that there have been mass deaths and incarcerations and family separations and all of these types of things historically because of the journey of African-Americans. And when you think about Blacks in church, as I pointed out earlier, to not just deal, but to be able to express that in certain areas, church being the preferred area, but the thought of sitting down with someone and saying, I want to address mental health issues is just not something that you hear very often, if at all, for African-Americans. So let's unpack this just a touch. I want you to consider three things from this webinar. And these three things hopefully will allow you to uh, take the information that I've given you, which is just a mere snapshot of the, the complex history of these people. But uh, to help you put what you see in context just a bit more, and have more of an understanding that when you watch what COVID-19 does to the country, when you watch the fear that it inflicts, when you watch the, the angst and anxiety that it inflicts, understand for many of the reasons that we've outlined and many of the things that we'll look at right now, it is compounded in the African-American community. The first thing you wanna consider is that mental health and trauma is often, often goes untreated. Mental health and trauma often goes untreated. And so as this article points out, the psychological distress for many Black Americans often goes untreated. And this is another area of disproportionate impact compared to white individuals that existed before the pandemic. When you look at the statistics cited here, 69% of Black adults with mental illness and 42% of Black adults with serious mental illness received no treatment. And this is for 2018. Similar situation for 2019 in 2020. 88% of black adults with substance uh, 
with substance use disorders reported receiving no treatment in 2018. Substance use has increased during the pandemic and pre-existing trends such as increased drug use deaths, drug-induced deaths among Native Americans, Blacks, Latinx, and older adults may only get worse. And so this trend alone is adding to what you see going on in the African-American community because of COVID-19. Some of what we've outlined gives you a, a good idea, if you weren't already aware, of what life can be like or has been like for African-Americans and how African-Americans are still plugged into that story. But the stress that comes along with that is oftentimes not analyzed, dealt with, or addressed. This is something that personally I've had to learn to appreciate. And full disclosure, I myself sit down for counseling on a regular basis. And I'll take a hiatus as things start to uh, level out, if you will. And as time set in that bring about negative thoughts and behaviors, I will plug back into therapy. And I have found it to be of great value and benefit. And it's interesting when you talk to relatives and you make that confession, the wall starts to fall. And I have confessed that at family events and I've had relatives, you know, kind of on the sly, like, hey, how long you been doing that? And I tell them about, well, what made you start? What are the sessions like? What are you talking about? Is it helping you? How is it helping you? And one by one, I've had more relatives take the step of some sort of counseling for some reason. And to a person, what they find is, wow, this was really a needed and necessi necessary exercise in order for me to become holistically healthy. It matters. But until that becomes commonplace, until it ceases to be anathema in the African-American community, this fact that we are considering will always be something that plays along just beneath the surface. And when things come along that, add, that, that injects added stress to the African-American community, this compounds it. The second thing that we wanna consider for COVID-19 is that it's created somewhat of the perfect storm in the black community. The perfect storm in many ways, if you've watched the news and you've seen the disproportionate impact You've probably also seen them outline some of the reasons why. And that the pre-existing conditions, and not just the pre-existing health conditions, but the pre-existing societal conditions based upon systemic racism has made this a very, very difficult time for African-Americans. I go back to the article and it says the distress is increased by fears of getting infected, particularly as Black Americans and their families are highly represented among, among essential workers and have suffered more deaths of family and community members. Stop right there. The essential workers part. I cannot tell you to include my younger sister who works at a hospital here and nieces and cousins and aunts and uncles that work in the medical field, especially as essential workers, who from the very beginning of this pandemic could not get out of the way of the pandemic. Some of these relatives have quarantined on multiple occasions. Some of these relatives have treated people that are COVID-19 positive and have had to deal with the emotional effects of that. And to go back to some of those funerals that I talked about, I attended for the last month, Several of those were due to COVID-19, all of which were over the age of 60. And so that fear sets in because of all the different people in your family and in your sphere of influence and in your circle that are in positions or in harm's way when it comes to COVID-19. It also says they continue to face the highest risk of exposure, whether through their work in healthcare, and other essential services, their greater use of public transportation to get to work or in their homes. When you think about the whole idea of redlining, 
that went on throughout this country many years ago. And the ripple effects of that are still being felt. The corralling of poor individuals, Blacks in particular, into certain areas, housing projects throughout this country, here and abroad in Erie, Pennsylvania. It is very difficult to socially distance. It is very difficult when you have multiple people in the house. It's very difficult when there's this interconnection between families, grandparents, aunts, uncles, oftentimes living together. This network is very, very tight knit. And as we've explained to you earlier, this, net, this network has become tighter and tighter and tighter as time has gone on through necessity. Because in many ways, all African-Americans have had was themselves to depend upon. If you go to the third paragraph in recent surveys, Blacks are three times as likely to know someone who has died from COVID-19 than whites. That personal impact, whether in family or community networks, have left many to face unexpected loss. And so the stress factor among African-Americans is higher. And lastly, the loss of community members compounded by the relative isolation based on stay-at-home orders and social distancing measures, act as a stressor by limiting access to those very support systems. Hence these detrimental effects that we're talking about. And so put all of this in one big recipe for disaster, if you will. Put all of this in the bowl and mix it together. And you think about that journey that we are referring to. You think about that interconnectedness that we are referring to. And you think about how being a part of these networks and having that sense of belonging does so much to balance the mental health issues that many African-Americans deal with in the first place, the trauma that many African-Americans deal with in the first place. And I want to expound on this for just a second to be clear about something, because I, like several others, am in a position where I am continually working within other communities, oftentimes, be it on boards that I serve on, committees that I serve on, rooms that I'm, I'm a part of, clients that I may have. Oftentimes, I am one of few Blacks in the room. Many times, I'm the only Black that's in the room. And the mistake that's made is people will assume the posture of, well, Marcus, you're used to that by now. Not so. It's a necessity, and it's something that I take head on. But so often, you know, my, my connections to these communities increases the more I'm put in a position of being the only or one of few in the room, just to balance it out. I've oftentimes, I've oftentimes asked white friends of mine, how often are you the only white person in the room? How many times does that happen in a day, in a week, in a month, in a year? And when it's happened, I want you to think about how that felt. Now, once you've become one and you've been able to kind of recall that feeling, I want you to multiply that and imagine yourself walking into that feeling three to five times a week, if not more. How much would you need to go back and reconnect to the environment that you feel most comfortable with? How much would you have to increase your diet for that if you were in this position regularly? And so when you go to this isolation, what happens when you take people of this profile and you isolate them for a day, for a week, for a month, for multiple months? When you look at the role of the church, it's easy to say, how irresponsible is that, that you are still gathering at church but then you remember when you think about who these people are, that that is one of few lifelines and has been a lifeline for this group of people for centuries, for an array of reasons. 
And because there's no expression of that frustration, there's no expression of that trauma in front of a clinical expert, that church has become their therapy on top of their expression of worship to their God. And so as the days linger for the social isolation, the more the need is for institutions like that which leads to additional exposure to COVID-19. When these funerals happen, it's easy to say, have the funeral via Facebook, and many churches do that. But when they say you have the option of coming to show up to, to pay homage to our sister or our brother in person, a lot of people choose that because it gives them that sense of place and that sense of belonging. And these are traditions that have helped African-Americans hold on for a long time in this country. The isolation, the opposite of that, is very difficult. Third thing that we want to consider is the trust factor. And as we move toward a vaccination, on the one hand, it's very, very hopeful that this is something that um, can be eradicated soon or slowed tremendously. It is very hopeful news. On the other hand, you have to look at the historical journey again for African-Americans. And this does a great job of pointing that out because historically speaking, this group of people have been exploited. Historically speaking, vaccinations, eugenics, genocide, all of these different topics play into how African-Americans view the solution to things along these lines. And so although we have a vaccination forthcoming, it's very difficult for African-Americans to instantly jump on board with it, as silly as that may sound to some. It's been a raging debate actually on social media. Are you taking the vaccine? Are you not taking the vaccine? And when you watch the answers, especially from people of color, it's very fascinating. You see these different takes and often all, almost all the time, it comes down to one simple word, trust. In the mental state and the paranoia and the frustration and the stress, all of these things are compounded as they are isolated, as we are isolated. And you're watching the news and it's feeding this internal hysteria that you add to everything that you're already experiencing and becomes increasingly difficult to cope. And so when it comes to uh, the acceptance of even the solution in order to cross over and get back into everyday life, a couple of points to consider is that the political and medical leadership need to engage stakeholders and obtain critical input from schools, elementary to undergraduate. And this article points out some of the very same things that we talked about, fraternities and sororities, houses of worship and community centers need to be engaged about identifying solutions to support the community. Now, why would they say that? Why would it be necessary to plug into these institutions in order to not become educated and informed, because if you see how the article is worded, to obtain critical input. So this is not a mission of, let me tell you why you should take the vaccination, socially distance, distance, uh, so on and so forth. The goal is to listen and to receive information from credible sources. What are some of the barriers that you as a group deal with when it comes to COVID-19? What are some of the barriers that exist in the African-American community when it comes to accepting the notion of a vaccine? What are some of the negative effects that you're seeing African-Americans deal with because of COVID-19? Everything starts and ends with a story. And these stories have infinite value 
And these stories are oftentimes represented in some of the very institutions outlined in this article. And as you think about that, it is a wonderful time to learn. One of the things that COVID-19 has done, it, is, has, it has underscored all of the differences that exist in society. It has taken many of the things that we know exist, systemic racism, and the effects of systemic racism, the fallout from systemic racism, and understanding that these things are rarely, if ever, spoken about in schools, in occupations, and they may be, there, there may be a special event in which they speak about it on television. But for the most part, these things are buried or not spoken about very often. 2020 has laid bare all of those things, not just the African-American community, but in communities of color overall, in poor communities, in the prison industrial complex. And when you take COVID-19 and add it to America's reckoning with racial injustice, you now add another layer to this social isolation. Because if you think about it, more than ever, myself included, African-Americans find themselves needing, needing to plug into their networks as America has this great reckoning. Needing to plug into these networks as they process what they've seen with people like George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, needing these networks to vent in a way that doesn't offend. Needing these networks to feel understood and to feel that sense of belonging and that sense of place that we've discussed so far on this webinar. More than ever before in the last few decades have African-Americans needed that connection. And in that very same time, simultaneously, COVID rages and it brings us further apart. And so what does that look like for African-Americans? What does that feel like for African-Americans? What does that sound like for African-Americans? And best practice is to find respected and trusted institutions to plug into in order to really put your finger on the pulse of that. In this part about building trust, the article goes on to say that they can ensure that the critical message about science, health, safety, and resources are communicated through trusted community networks and sources. Community leaders can help spread vital information about health and vaccines. And even here at the public's voice, as other organizations have done and are doing, we have released a series of videos on the importance of wearing masks, on the importance of social distancing. And we are part of an effort to try to bring more awareness to the mental health challenges that faces the African-American community. These things are key if we are to not just deal with the virus itself, if we are to not just deal with the social isolation, the social, iso social isolation and the fallout of that, these things are key as we think about life after the pandemic. After the pandemic. There's an organization here in Erie called the Blue Coats. And the Blue Coats, much like it describes in this article, are a trusted group of individuals from the community. And they've dedicated themselves to keeping our community safe, the children of our community safe. And the mission and the ministry, if you will, because it started at a church by Pastor, Pastor Gaines. The ministry and the mission was very simple. It's to make sure that children before and after school got to school safely, got home safely, and felt secure in their own neighborhood. 
And that has grown into so much more as we talk about this particular process of building trust. From everything from gang interventions to helping people in the judicial system as they stand before judges, members of this organization stand with them. And now doing outreach in communities, disseminating information about wearing masks and social distancing. But when you talk to this organization and you talk to its leadership, one of the things that you learn very quickly is that the stress compounded by this social, isol this social isolation is affecting the relationship between parent and child to a great extent. I want you to think about everything that we've discussed this morning. And I want you to apply that in a very real way. And I want you to think about someone who has dealt with all of the different things that we've addressed here and some of the things that we haven't addressed that you know to be an issue in, this, in society where African-Americans are concerned. And now when you add to that, children staying at home and learning like this, not having that socialization, not having an opportunity to build this sense of place, this sense of belonging. And a parent with these same systemic struggles. And even though it isn't all, there are more than enough parents to where these struggles are boiling over and you see the effects of it in the way they're dealing with their and our children. This isolation, has so many ripple effects. And so if you think about the traditional things that you are hearing about from COVID-19, the number of domestic violence issues spiking, the numbers of child abuse issues spiking, the numbers for drug abuse, substance abuse, alcohol abuse, the numbers for suicides, all of these numbers that are spiking because of COVID-19. Take that and multiply that several times over for a group that has already been dealing with multiple issues leading up to this point. And you start to get a feeling of what it means when you talk about the detrimental effects of isolation on the African-American community. So not necessarily a death now, and it certainly does not signal the end of community, if you will. But this does underscore the need of doubling down on not just the vaccine, which is certainly necessary in an unprecedented way, but it underscores the need of doubling down on the emotional fallout the likes that we haven't seen in generations from COVID-19. And so this will beg or call for multiple efforts by, by way of programming, multiple efforts by way of interventions, multiple efforts to bring people together to talk and process this as a community and to be intentional about the effects on specific segments, families, single parent families, older people, young people, and all of these different segments of society. I hope that this is something that you found informative. I hope this is something that you found um, enlightening. And I hope that this is something that you consider as you read articles about COVID-19, as you watch TV shows and news reports about COVID-19. And I hope that this encourages you to research just a bit more what this pandemic has meant to African-Americans and minorities in general. I hope it encourages you to look at the pre-existing conditions that have existed in society for far too long. And I hope it brings a heightened sense of awareness about the need to address the issues that have made this particular pandemic untenable in many ways for one group more than another. 
I'm Marcus Atkinson. I'm here for, with Preferred Systems. I thank you for listening this morning and reach out to someone and have a conversation about this very thing as opposed to just being curious on your own. No question is a bad question if it is asked in genuineness with an open mind, with the thought process and desire to learn more so that we can all as a society do better. Take care and thank you for tuning in.